Welcome back. So, we are going to resume our discussions and uh, in this session we are going to compare embedded systems and general purpose computing systems. So, the first difference is that embedded systems are dedicated for specific tasks. They may be one task or they may be few tasks, they may be more than one task, but that number is fixed. As against a general purpose computing system where you can put any applications, you can add applications, uh, embedded systems are different from such uh, general purpose systems. The, as an example, if I have a microwave oven, the embedded computer in the microwave oven is designed only to cook food. I cannot reprogram it and expect it to wash clothes. That is the kind of glaring difference that I have and uh, between an embedded computer and a general purpose computer. The second difference is that embedded computers can be implemented using a wide variety of processors. As you saw, uh, a processor, a microcontroller smaller than a grain of rice and on the, on the other extreme, a big microcontroller more than an inch square. But when you look at general purpose computing devices, usually you use the highest performance processor that is available. The third difference is that embedded systems are cost sensitive. What is the meaning? Because you are buying a product, you are not buying a computer. The embedded computer that forms part of that embedded system gadget is a carries a small fa fraction of cost and therefore, uh, embedded computers, embedded systems are very cost sensitive. And the fourth difference is that embedded systems are supposed to offer and work under real time constraints. The meaning is that whenever there is a input change, environmental change, the embedded systems are supposed to react to that change and provide an output in a timely fashion. If the there is delay in producing the output, it may lead to fatality, it may lead to loss of life. As an example, if the embedded computer which is flying an aircraft and the pilot uh, wants the aircraft to climb and the embedded computer does not uh, you know perform appropriately and keeps on flying at the same level, it may lead to a crash. Now, you do not expect such a behavior out of a general purpose computing system. Often times you may have noticed that you press a key and your laptop or desktop does not respond, it is alright because it is not going to uh, kill anybody. And so, there is vast difference between the expectations of an embedded computer in terms of uh, requiring a real time response. The fourth difference or fifth difference is that embedded systems are designed to operate in an extreme environmental uh, conditions. Take the example of a, a, a missile system, that missile could be launched from uh, glacier uh, environment or uh, it could be launched from deserts and they must perform. Usually embedded systems run out of a ROM, meaning that the program that is stored in the embedded computer is stored in a ROM, that is read only memory, a permanent memory. But often times, not often times, most of the times the program that runs on your desktop or laptop computer is running in the RAM. Yes, a desktop or a laptop, laptop system also has a ROM which is used uh, at the beginning when you uh, power on your device and that program is called uh, a boot up program called BIOS basic input output system. Once that uh, completes execution, the transfer, uh, the control is transferred to the operating system on the hard disk and then to the program that you would uh, like to run. These programs are loaded in the RAM of the general purpose computing system. So, that is a vast difference between how an embedded system operates and how a general purpose computing system operates. Another difference is that embedded systems have, have resource constraints. What are resources of a computer? The computational capability is a resource. The way the embedded system or the computer communicates with the outside world is a, is a uh, resource and you see when you have a general purpose computing system such as your laptop or desktop, it has many ways of communicating with the outside world. It has ethernet, it has Wi-Fi, it has firewire, it has USB and so on. But uh, does your microwave have a ethernet connection? Can you control it with a, uh, your phone through Bluetooth? Most probably not. Although in recent times, there are certain examples of such embedded applications with connectivity. But that connectivity is based on the requirement, not because you want to flaunt that your computer has so many ways of communicating with the outside world. 
So, embed systems are uh, embed systems have resource constraints. There are examples of for example, a washing machine which is called uh, IoT washing machine. That washing machine can communicate with the outside world through internet and the purpose is not that you would want to control this washing machine sitting in your office, but when the washing machine is operating at home and encounters a loss in performance, it can communicate that to the service provider, the maintenance guy, so that they can come and provide annuals, uh, provide uh, preventive maintenance uh, before the uh, washing machine actually stops working. So, this is an example where you have a communication protocol, communication link on your embedded device, but it is out of necessity as a feature, not because you have you want to say that your washing machine has so many ways of communicating with the outside world. Embedded systems are infrequently reprogrammed. What is the meaning? that once you load a program in an embedded application, you do not ever change it. You do not use change it most of the time and in most cases you do not ever change it. But in a general purpose computing device, every time you run an application, a new application you are reprogramming that device. How many times have you encountered a situation that somebody has come to your home saying that they would like to upgrade the firmware of your washing machine? I have never encountered it, it is it does not happen. And so, that is the meaning of this uh, uh, point that embedded systems are infrequently reprogrammed. Embedded systems have hard reliability and correctness constraints. All computers must operate correctly, but embedded systems have an additional responsibility that they must uh, continue to uh, provide service reliably, not all, most of them, many of them, some of them. Why? Because failure to do so may lead to loss of life. As an example, medical devices uh, like an x-ray machine, you do not want the computer in the x-ray machine to fail and uh, it may give uh, needlessly high dose of x-ray to the patient under the x-ray machine. Uh, in an aircraft, you do not want the computer flying the aircraft to fail uh, leading to loss of life and so embedded computers are expected, some of the embedded computers are expected to have hard reliability uh, requirements. Okay, now, that we have uh, seen major differences between embedded computers and general purpose computing devices, it is time to uh, go through certain terminologies that we use. And, and for uh, many of you or some of you, it may be a repeat of things that you already know, but it does not hurt. So, the first uh, uh, terminology is what is a computer? A computer is nothing but a system which has a CPU that is a central processing unit memory and input output ports. Let me draw a diagram to illustrate it. So, this is your CPU, this is your memory and usually you would require two types of memories. One is the ROM which stores your program, the other is the RAM which has uh, which, where, which you use for uh, variables and then you would have certain I O devices, maybe an input device and an output device. Let me erase this and write it here. And how does the CPU communicate with this, with these devices? Through buses these buses are for data and for address and another set of bus is what we call as the control bus which tells whether you are reading information or writing information and all these So, this is the uh, diagram for a computer, here is the CPU, ROM, RAM that is memory and input output ports. The second uh, 
terminology is a microprocessor. Microprocessor. A microprocessor is nothing but a CPU on a single chip. How did it happen? In the 50s and 60s, the uh, CPU was made with uh, discrete components or discrete integrated circuits in the 60s. In 1971, a startup at that time that was called Intel and today Intel is a giant. Uh, made an interesting device. What it did was it integrated the functionality of a CPU on a single substrate of silicon. What does a CPU entail? A CPU has four components. It has, uh, so a CPU has control unit, it has registers in which temporary information is stored. It has an ALU through which uh, it can perform mathematical and logical operations and it has a bus interface unit through which the CPU can communicate with the outside world to the, through the to the memory and to the IO ports. Now, all these were originally in the 50s and 60s implemented using discrete components discrete integrated circuits and what the what Intel did in 1971 is that it integrated all these on a single substrate of silicon and made a IC out of it and that IC was named 4004 microprocessor and the term microprocessor, microprocessor came about. So, that is the uh, definition of microprocessor. Then what happened? When people started using a microprocessor to create computers, it drastically reduced the size of the computers. Earlier, uh, in the earlier days, the computers would probably fill a uh, half a room but now suddenly you could fit the entire functionality of a computer on a single printed circuit board and such computers were called microcomputers. So, a microcomputer is nothing but a microprocessor plus memory plus I O devices on a single printed circuit board. In the same uh, scalability fashion, the entire functionality of the microcontroller people thought could be integrated on a single piece of silicon and what happened? It led to a microcontroller. So, a microcontroller is nothing but a microcomputer on a single chip. What? Who did that? It turns out incidentally that the world's first microcontroller was in 1974, it was TMS 1000 and this was by a company which is incidentally also supporting our uh, program this course here Texas Instruments. This was a 4 bit microcontroller, I am going to use this terminology mu c to indicate that it is a microcontroller. Now, obviously, uh, you may have heard of uh, uh, Moore's law that says that it is not really a law, it is an observation that every 18 months that is one and a half years the number of components, number of transistors that you could integrate on a piece of silicon would double. Now, what would you do with these uh, increasing number of transistors? Of course, you could fit more and more functionality on a single piece of silicon. And so, this is the reason why you had a, a microprocessor and from the microprocessor you had a microcontroller. What next? Now, when you use a microcontroller in any control or embedded application, Apart from the microcontroller, here is your microcontroller, you still need analog components. For example, I may have a certain sensor and the output of this sensor may need to be amplified with the help of an operational amplifier, right. And so, I need to provide a certain amount of gain. So, I am going to put components like this. This is, uh, this is going to, so this is my sensor here. This sensor, the output voltage of this sensor is going to be amplified this with this. Maybe with another op amp circuit, I am going to uh, amplify, I am going to uh, filter this uh, signal in some way and eventually 
feed it to the microcontroller maybe to the ADC input. We will come to uh, more details about this ADC input, but you see if I have to design a system out of a microcontroller apart from the microcontroller which has already integrated so many components on a single integrated circuit, I still need these additional components. These are analog devices, analog components and it is very diff difficult to make analog devices and program them. Meaning, if I have an amplifier, how do I write a program to change the gain of the amplifier? How do I write a program to change the cutoff frequency of a filter or the gain or the uh, slope of that filter or the order of that filter? It is very difficult, but interestingly that also happened and that led to a definition called system on chip. A system on chip in this context is a microcontroller plus analog components which are programmable and this was by a company called uh, uh, Cypress uh, Semiconductors. What they did was they added uh, microcontroller plus analog building blocks and you could change the functionality of these analog building blocks by merely writing a program. So, you could decide that today I want the analog building block to uh, function like an amplifier with a certain gain or change the topology of the amplifier to be uh, inverting or a non-inverting or a differential amplifier or you want that uh, analog building block to be of uh, to provide the functionality of a filter in which case what is the cutoff frequency, what is the topology of that filter, do we want it to be of the low pass, band pass, high pass, band reject, notch and so on. And so, this provides great uh, uh, functionality. And so, having a system on chip which integrates not only the microcontroller, but also analog uh, building blocks will reduce the size of the uh, eventual app, uh, system to a single integrated circuits and that is a great uh, improvement and we will see how. Here is an example of a single board computer using a microprocessor. You see a single uh, printed circuit board has been used. This is just to show you how from the earlier times where the entire computer would be a big uh, device has been shrunk to the size of a single PCB. Anyway, now in the context of system on chip, uh, I want to clarify that there are uh, certain interpretations of this system on chip. One is that uh, system on chip is nothing in our context of embedded systems that uh, system on chip is a microcontroller plus programmable analog components on a single uh, substrate of uh, silicon. But in general, when people refer to this term system on chip, they mean probably a microprocessor or a microcontroller together with some custom functional units, uh, unit or units you know on a single uh, piece of silicon and that uh, they mean system on chip. And so, it is very important to know the context is the person talking about an embedded application where it might mean uh, a microcontroller and analog components or in a general context. Anyway, now we come to this point we have we have mentioned this earlier that a microcontroller is a popular method of implementing the embedded computer, but what are the other methods we must be aware of them. So, the first method to by which we can implement an embedded computer is through a general purpose processor meaning a microprocessor for example. Another method is to use what is called as a application specific processor. What are the examples of application specific processors? Well, a microcontroller is an example of uh, application specific processor. Also a digital signal processor which is a specialized uh, processor which can perform digital signal processing more efficiently than it is possible with a general purpose processor. And the third method is what we call as single purpose computer. I would like to elaborate on these three approaches. In a general purpose processor, basically you are saying I am going to use a microprocessor, but a microprocessor is only one part of the entire ecosystem of a computer. Apart from the microprocessor, what you need is you need external memory of the type of ROM or of the type of RAM and then you are going to need ports. And so, what it would lead to is that it will not remain a very efficient from a size point of view, it will not be a very efficient implementation because a microprocessor offers certain amount of uh, memory that is if for example, your let us write this down. If my microprocessor has certain amount of data lines, let us say this is data and common examples are 
8 or 16 bits or 32 bits. It also has the data is by the way bidirectional. It could have ad, it would have address lines. Let's say it has 20 address lines. If it has 20 address lines, that means it can access how many memory locations? 2 raised to the power 20, which is equal to 1, 0, 4, 8, 5, 7, 6 memory locations, that is 1 million. Now, it can communicate or it can talk to 1 million memory locations. It is up to you to provide the requisite amount of memory. Maybe you realize or you anticipate that your application is going to need 16 kilobytes of ROM, another 16 kilobytes of RAM. So, you have to uh, add uh, appropriate memory devices to fulfill the requirement. So, this would lead to a physically large system as far as implementation is concerned. On the other hand, when you choose to have uh, when you choose to implement that application using an application specific processor such as a microcontroller, a microcontroller is going to have a microprocessor that is a CPU on the uh, on that uh, silicon substrate. Apart from the CPU, it is also going to have RAM and ROM in various types of a fixed amount. Maybe it has uh, 8 kilobytes of ROM and 8 kilobytes of RAM. If you find that this uh, this amount of memory is suitable for a particular application, it may make a better sense to use an application specific processor such as this microcontroller to implement that system, because it would lead to reduction in size and reduction in cost. It would improve reliability, because there are less number of components to solder. So, it would be a more reliable system. And so, often times you would implement your application with a microcontroller as an example of application specific processor. But that is not all, you can also implement the same system with a single purpose computer. And I am going to illustrate uh, these three uh, approaches using a certain block diagrams. Now, when I implement uh, an application using a general purpose processor, here I have drawn a, uh, a block diagram. This is an alternative view to view to understand what is the meaning of a microprocessor. Now, one way to understand microprocessor which we have seen is that a microprocessor is nothing but a uh, uh, ALU, registers, control logic and bus interface unit on a single piece of silicon. That is to indicate these four components as functional units. There is an alternative view to understand how a computer works and which is through this diagram that we have two blocks, one is called the sequencer and the other called other one is called the data path. The sequencer consists of the control logic, it has instruction decoder and a program counter. And the sequencer talks to an external memory device such as the ROM or EEPROM or other types of memory devices. And the reason why you can implement any different type of uh, application is by changing the contents of the program. The sequencer understands the instructions and based on the sequence of these instructions which you as a user have to write, it can implement a different application. It does that by providing inputs to the second part of the building block which is the data path. And data path consists of the registers for storing temporary values and the registers feed the arithmetic logic unit. So, essentially the sequencer and data path form the CPU. This CPU could be in the form of individual ICs or it could be in the form of a microprocessor. And that is the alternative view to look at a general purpose processor you are going to need external program memory and data memory. Program memory feeds the sequencer, data memory is connected to the data path, so that you can store variables. So, while this is the general per, this is the block diagrammatic approach of alternative approach of looking at the general purpose processor. Let us see if we were to implement an application using a general purpose processor, what would it look like. And for example, we have a Anyway, before we come to that example, let me show you the block diagram for an application specific processor also. This application specific processor also has a sequencer which consists of the control logic, it has the instruction decoder and the program counter which is connected to the program memory. The program memory is uh, populated, is filled up with instructions you, by you as the, uh, the designer. Uh, the sequencer reads the contents of the program memory and executes whatever that uh, program memory instruction uh, expects you to do and then controls uh, the operation through the data path which consists of 
uh, registers and a ALU. Now, in the previous case, the ALU was a general purpose ALU, but for an application specific processor, it may be a custom ALU, meaning you would want to do certain operations more often, therefore, you provide that arithmetic logic unit with that additional functionality. Like in a, uh, a DSP, uh, a DSP operation requires a repeated multiplication and, and addition of numbers. And so, in a DSP, you have a ALU which has a feature called MAC, multiply and accumulate, right. Apart from that, the program memory and data memory could be integrated on the same chip. If you see this uh, block diagram, I have drawn a dotted line around the uh, components to indi indicate that these four block diagrams are actually could be integrated on a single piece of substrate to give you a more efficient implementation. Now, let us look at the block diagram of a single purpose processor, which is consi which consists of a sequencer, which is implemented as a state machine. State machine is another word for a finite state machine or a state machine. It is usually implemented with the uh, memory building blocks such as a flip flop. That sequencer communicates with data processing element. Now, in contrast to the data processing elements that is the data path in a general purpose processor or application specific processor where you have registers and ALU to perform those operations, nothing is fixed for the data processing elements in a data path of a single purpose processor. Why? Because the purpose is fixed and it is only one purpose that you want to design it for, you put appropriate data processing elements which could be decoder, adder, it could be an encoder, multiplexer, demultiplexer and so on and so forth. And of course, the data path could uh, would want to store some information. So, it has uh, memory uh, usually in the form of a RAM and so when you design a system which is expected to perform only one task and you have specifically designed this hardware just to do this and nothing else, this would be called a single purpose processor. And any application could be implemented in any of these three ways and it, it would depend on you as a designer of embed systems to decide whether you want to go through a general purpose processor route or do you want to use a microcontroller which is an example of an application specific processor or do you want to go single purpose, uh, single purpose computer. Now, uh, I have this, uh, I have an example where a particular application was implemented using these three approaches. The first one was implementation of a particular project which is a, a roulette wheel game using 8085 microprocessor. This is the block diagram. If you see this, it has so many building blocks. One block, let us go from the left, you have the microprocessor which is 8085 in this case. Uh, microprocessor requires RAM and ROM which are indicated uh, on the middle blocks. These have to be decoded, the address of these devices have to be decoded. So, there is decoding circuitry and then you need certain output ports to indicate the uh, state of the game to the user and so for that we have four ports which has which is connected to uh, four seven segment displays, few discrete LEDs, a buzzer and a ring of LEDs, two rings of LEDs to indicate the game that you are playing that you want to place your bet and then you want to roll, you want to let the uh, roulette wheel roll and then it will stop, uh, it will, uh, the speed of rolling will slow down and it will stop somewhere. If that matches with the bet that you have placed, you win, otherwise you lose. And this was implemented using 885 and here is a schematic diagram. As you see, it uses so many uh, integrated circuits. I also have a picture of the uh, actual implementation. On the left, you have a PCB where the, uh, the middle top uh, IC is the 8085 microprocessor. At the bottom, you have a ROM and RAM. Uh, the ROM is in the form of a E square PROM and you have these latches on the left and right and on your right is the actual input output board where you see two rings of LEDs, the red and the green and at the center you have the seven segment displays. And obviously, as you see, it uses far too many ICs. My students implemented the same design, same application using a microcontroller. This is the block diagram of a Arduino which is a microcontroller. Basically, Arduino uses AVR microcontroller. This is an uh, application using uh, Arduino and you can see this block, this block diagram, you see suddenly the number of blocks have reduced. Why? Because the microcontroller has integrated the microprocessor and memory and ports into a single chip, therefore the size reduces. Here is the schematic diagram of the micro, uh, microcontroller based uh, roulette wheel. As you see, the components have reduced 
And here is the photograph. As you see, you have a very small PCB on your left, which is just one microcontroller, a switch and so on. And on your right, you still have the uh, LED rings, uh, red and green and the seven segment displays. This is the second, second implementation of the uh, roulette wheel game. And then we also have the uh, implementation using the single purpose computer implementation using a CPLD. CPLD stands for complex programmable logic device. This is a device that you can program to implement a custom uh, circuit. And this is the block diagram. You see this block diagram is split in two parts, which is exactly what we had discussed earlier that it consists of a sequencer, which is the finite state machine in this case. The finite state machine controls the data path where the actual operations, the processing of information, processing of data uh, takes place. In this case, several building blocks of uh, processing that data are being used. For example, this uses a counter. It also has a comparator for comparing the numbers that are being generated. And on the left, uh, uh, le rightmost side, you have uh, decoders for controlling 36 red LEDs and another decoder for controlling 36 green LEDs, which would form the inner and outer ring of the roulette wheel. This is the schematic diagram. As you see, it has a CPLD and all these LEDs and all that. And you see there are no, almost no other ICs being used other than a clock generator based on a triple five timer IC. And here you can see the actual implementation, a single sing, uh, printed circuit board pretty much, which has the LEDs on the outer periphery and at the center you have the CPLD IC. So you see it is possible to implement any embedded application in three ways. The general purpose processor approach, which usually involves lot many uh, components. There may be some good reason for you to use that approach, but uh, from the point of view of cost and reliability and economics, maybe you would want to implement the same application using an, uh, using an embedded computer. Uh, using a microcontroller and the third approach of course is the uh, single purpose computer and there are many many applications which are done using this approach. I want to show you how things used to be designed earlier in 60s and 70s integrated circuits. On your uh, left is a picture of a design engineers inspecting the layout of an IC. You see the IC itself is very small probably a millimeter square or a couple of millimeters or thereabouts. But you can't uh, inspect the design on a, such a small uh, piece of uh, substrate. And so you blow it up by several magnitudes and then it occupies almost a big room. And you see these design engineers are uh, inspecting the design. And today you don't have to do that at all because you are using CAD tools and uh, languages which are designed for design, uh, which are uh, created for implementing uh, and designing hardware. And so on the right, you have a v synthesizable code to uh, implement a 8085 microprocessor. Of course, this is just an example. And today, you would not implement a 8085 microprocessor. You would implement whatever uh, fancies you, whatever is in your mind. And you can use a language such as VHDL or Verilog to implement that uh, circuit. Uh, Till this time, we have discussed uh, implementation of the embedded system from a processor that is the embedded computer point of view. But that is not the complete story because we would like to build a complete system. So at a system level, what are the various approaches? It turns out that there are two popular approaches. One is that you build everything from scratch on your own, meaning you decide what embedded computer you are going to use. For that, what kind of circuitry is required, what kind of additional components are required. You would need a printed circuit board for that. You design it, you get it fabricated and then you integrate the all the components on that PCB. And usually you will take this approach when you are expecting large volumes because you would benefit from economies of scale. But when your applications are not, when your requirements are not that large, volumes are not that large, there is a alternative methods method and I call it COTS approach that is components of the shelf. Meaning you buy things that are available and you quickly integrate it and implement your design. And these days you could implement this cost of cost approach using uh, popular uh, single board computers which are very powerful computers today such as Raspberry Pi or BeagleBone Black single board computer. In the earlier times or even today if uh, there is such a need 
you would use a regular PC motherboard to implement what you want. So we uh, at this point we are at a stage where we have seen uh, all these things uh, you can do with embed systems, how you implement the processor, how do you how you implement the system. And I would like to now give you a small demonstration of MSP430 based projects that have been designed in my lab so that you the uh, student, you the participant can feel confident that if my students can do it in my lab, you sitting wherever you are sitting can also design such systems. All right. So, let us uh, have a look at some of these projects. For that, let me start with the simple project first. This is a project which is a, uh, a battery less electronic dice, but it has only one display. Often times you play a game where you need two dice and so here is another uh, implementation. Uh, this has two displays and to use it again this is battery less. So, I will shake it and when I stop you see two numbers, two random numbers are being printed here. Again I take it when I stop it produces two random numbers. What does it use? It uses MSP430 microcontroller at the uh, in the middle you have the uh, a tube which produces uh, which converts mechanical energy into electrical energy for the circuit to operate and it the, on this side you have capacitors which store the uh, voltage that is produced uh, so that the circuit can operate. And you see this entire system has been fabricated in my lab, these uh, PCBs have been uh, fabricated locally and the entire system has been integrated here. This is the second project. Uh, continuing with the uh, LED projects, here we have another system, we call it the color mixer because it, it is going to mix three primary colors, uh, green, blue and red and create a custom color. I have uh, the power supply for this comes uh, with the help of uh, in the form of this uh, power bank. I am going to uh, connect it to show to you. Now, this is how it works. The I am going to reduce the colors. So, this is green, uh, 256 levels of green, uh, blue color again 256 levels, here again uh, 256 levels of red and I can add to certain levels of red, I can add certain amount of blue and you see the I get various shades of magenta or instead of blue I can add green and I get various shades of yellow or into this now I can add uh, blue and I get various shades of white and so on. And so, because this uses MSP430 microcontroller, it controls these three LEDs using a concept called pulse width modulation that we are going to cover. And because each primary color has 256 levels, the total number of colors that can be made out of this color mixer are 256 cube which is 16 million colors. This is the number of colors that can be made with this. Then I have this project which we call the uh, electronic birthday blowout candles. These are supposed to be uh, birthday candles so that uh, they function without uh, using real candles. Real candles with small kids can lead to a fire hazard and here so we have done away with real candles and instead used LEDs to mimic the function of a candle. Now, if these are candles or if these are mimicking the uh, operation of a candle, then I should be able to blow them off like I can blow off normal candles. And that is the magic here. We have used a sensor a thermistor which will detect air blow when I blow on it. The microcontroller here is going to sense the uh, air uh, blow on the thermistor and will randomly turn these uh, LEDs off. So, let me try and as you see it is also making a sound, it is going to it is playing happy birthday uh, uh, sound. So, this works like a uh, replacement to traditional uh, birthday candles it is ex perfectly safe to use any number of times uh, you or your kid would want to. Let me show you another project now and this is the this is a electronic uh, uh, sand glass 
So instead of a sand falling from one part of the sand glass onto the other side, here we use LEDs. As you see, as I'm holding it, this is the LEDs indicate as if sand is falling. Now if I turn this around, this sand should come to the neck and you see now it is falling in the other direction. And normal sand glass when it empties the sand, it doesn't say anything. But because this uses a uh, embedded computer, it will tell you that the time has elapsed. Now if I turn it around, again it is falling on the other side and this has been programmed to uh, empty the so called sand in about a minute of time. This also uses another uh, MSP430 microcontroller and the sensor for the orientation is also integrated in this project and in fact it was conceived and designed in the lab and this project actually I will show you this is the enclosure which was uh, made in the lab using a CNC machine. This is the embedded computer here, this is the sensor part here and it is being powered with two uh, AA sized uh, alkaline batteries. Let me show you another project and in this case this is a kaleidoscope, uh, LED kaleidoscope, uh, normal kaleidoscope has uh, glass pieces in the form of bangles and three uh, or four uh, mirrors uh, where uh, the external light is reflected, diffracted through the uh, glass pieces, glass bangles and you see multiple reflections through the uh, mirrors. In this case we have, we have done away with the natural light and uh, which means you can uh, use it anytime you want whether there is uh, outside light or not. Inside there are RGB LEDs, several of them and their lighting patterns change as you move it around. Why? Because we have integrated certain sensors in this and of course there are the mirrors also and an embedded computer MSP430 as you can probably see as I am turning the kaleidoscope uh, tube around the lighting patterns inside are changed and if you were to look through this you would see interesting patterns. In fact what I will do is I will uh, share pictures uh, with you of the uh, close up pictures uh, looking through this hole so that you can see how the lighting patterns look like. Now I have another project. This is a slightly advanced project based on MSP430 and this is called Talking Tom. Uh, this is the hardware implementation of a Talking Tom application you may have uh, seen on a mobile phone. What this does is on what that application does is that uh, it will record your sound and then it will play it back at higher pitch. So this uh, project we call Talking Tom, uh, we actually call it Talkative Tom because we did not want to have issues of uh, copyright names. Uh, this uh, does that and it also adds another feature that in a diff uh, second mode it can play back the recorded sound and so it will sound like an alien. So let me give you a demonstration of that. I have two selector switches here with which I turn it off and on and with the other switch I can select the uh, mode. In this case I have selected the uh, high pitch mode. Hello, this is the project demonstration of Talkative Tom. Hello, this is the project demonstration of Talkative Tom. Let me uh, change the mode and make it the alien mode. Hello, this is the project demonstration of Talkative Tom in the alien mode. The entire uh, enclosure was fabricated in the lab. Uh, as you can see the circuit board was also uh, fabricated and soldered in the lab. It has uh, integrated uh, battery source, uh, charger uh, and audio amplifier and speakers. And last but not the least, the project I am going to show you is a uh, uh, what we call as uh, the levitating doll. I am going to power it with a um, adapter, 12 volts adapter. In my hand is a 3D printed doll and in the hat of the doll there is a small magnet. There is a microcontroller on top and here I have a electromagnet. At the bottom of the electromagnet there is a Hall effect sensor which senses the position of this magnet when I hold it there and the microcontroller will maintain the position of this doll suspended in the air. In the air. Let us see how it works, you see it is floating in the air. Why? It is sensing the position if because of gravity the doll tries to fall it turns on the electromagnet. If the doll tries to come too close it turns off the electromagnet and this operation it is doing thousands of times a second to maintain the position at a given location. 
and all these are implemented by my students using MSP430 microcontroller and so if my students can do it, I am very sure you as my remote student can also do it. Thank you. We are going to continue uh, our next lecture uh, and talk about other issues related to embed systems. But at this point, I would like to uh, summarize what we have discussed here. We have gone through various definitions of embed systems. We have seen uh, application areas of embed systems. We have seen how embed systems could be implemented using a general purpose processor or a uh, application specific processor or using a single board computer. We have seen what are the characteristics of embed systems and at the end we have seen some applications uh, which I hope you found to be very encouraging. Thank you very much and I will see you in the next lecture. Bye bye.